After some technical difficulties, I'm delighted to be joined by David Barrow, a registered manager for Fostering. Thanks very much for joining us today, Dave. No, you're more than welcome. Uh, and so today we are going to be talking about fostering. As I said, Dave is our registered manager. He's been working in children's social care for over 25 years in both public and private sector. And since joining Family Care in 2016, he's developed a therapeutic fostering service, which we are all very proud of. So today we wanted to provide a general overview of fostering for people who are either thinking about it for the first time or maybe they've been thinking about it for a while. Uh, as we know, a lot of people are in that boat. And just a quick note, if you do have any questions as you're watching this, please feel free to leave them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Now, we know, Dave, from our social media channels, speaking to people about fostering, that this is something that a lot of people have thought about, but not gone further than that. So maybe to start with, why don't we outline what the requirements are for foster carers in the UK? Yeah, certainly. So obviously there are some regulatory um, areas that need to be maintained by the agency or people, criteria that people have to hit. Um, they are actually, in fact, very few, um, surprisingly so. So some of the, the, the key ones are um, a person to foster needs to be over the age of 21. There is no upper age limit. Um, I'll just stress that. A lot of people do ask, oh, am I too old? You know, is there an upper limit? No, there isn't. There is just a minimum age limit, which is 21. Um, everybody going into fostering either has to be a UK citizen, so a British citizenship, or indefinite leave to remain. Uh, the main reason behind that is some of our children could be with our foster carers 10, 15 years plus. So what we want to ensure is, is when we place children with a foster carer, um, there wouldn't be any visa issues or something like that, which may impact on that child having to move for no other reason. Um, the next one is quite a, 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 a touchy subject, I guess, and that is a spare bedroom. And a lot of people ask, well, why my children can share a room? There's no issues with my children sharing a room. Why does a, a looked after child have to have access to their own room? Um, one of the main reasons behind that is to allow a child that's suffered some form of trauma in their early life experience, have a safe set, have a safe place, have something that is just there for them where they can retreat to maybe where they need to maybe deregulate or just have some time out for themselves, just to have that real safe zone for them. So that's one of the main requirements. They are the basic minimum requirements laid down in legislation uh, for becoming a foster carer. Now, most agencies do have other remits or the specifics that they, they put on around their own policy or their own expectations uh, for foster carers. Mm. So in terms of those remits or other expectations, what are some of those for family care? Yeah, so, so one of those would be about availability. So when we're looking at applicants or assessing a new care, it's about uh, the, the family's availability um, to meet the needs of that child or, or, or that young person. So again, there's, uh, it's difficult to give yes and no answers. So we have many questions such as like as, well, I don't drive, um, I work part-time, I work full-time, I'm a single carer, uh, I'm a carer, but my partner works away. You know, does that mean I can foster or not be a foster carer? And unfortunately, quite often there is no yes or, or no response or correct answer because it's about individuals circumstances and context of their lives so an example would be a foster care that doesn't drive but lives within um, a city center say where their access to maybe 15 schools compared to a foster care that li doesn't drive lives in a very rural area you know one bus uh, a day coming in one bus a day coming out to to the nearest town sort of thing that would be very restrictive um for, for a child going to school maybe so that would be one. Mm -hmm. uh, personal qualities, you know, um, we don't expect any applicant coming through to be able to take all the boxes in one go. Um, that's what we are there for. We, as an agency, we're here to support career development, emotional development of, of applicants coming through. But, you know, we would look for someone that's got good listening skills, uh, show good empathy, uh, be able to work well. Communication is a key. 
you know, both written and verbal. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our carers spend large amounts of time recording, reporting information for, for children and young people or themselves, but also liaising with social workers, support workers, um, and other professionals, health professionals, and so communication is a really good one as well. Yeah. And I suppose in a way it kind of ties into availability, doesn't it? Because I think when people when you say availability, people think about physical availability, working patterns, and things like that, but actually being emotionally available for a young person and being able to work through problems with them. Yeah, most definitely. It's really key, you know. I think we have to remember that our, that our foster carers are are um, a fantastic breed of professionals and, 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 and individuals that are supporting, you know, at times some of the most traumatized children in the country. Mm -hmm. um, some of our children and young people don't know why they feel the way they do or they act in the way they do. So to our care is to be able to support and manage our young people and help them work through some yeah. of their own emotions and regulations is really, really important. One of the sort of most common pieces of feedback that we get um, with regards to fostering is people feeling that it's either too complex or too difficult to become a foster carer. Uh, and obviously there are different reasons for that. And we're well versed in them, aren't we, Dave? But would you like to just speak a little bit to that and maybe give people a bit of an understanding of why that might be? Yeah, of course, you know, and, and often we see it on, on sort of our Facebook posts, you know, why does the process take so long? Why is it so in-depth? Why is it so in, intrusive? You know, um, I think, uh, and this isn't to be derogatory, but a lot of people are like, well, Laura, I'd love to give, why can't I have a child now? And yeah, and, that, and that's right. Um, I think I want to start off by saying, you know, we have a duty to safeguard our children and young people. That That's you know, evident. But we've got a duty to safeguard our foster carers and applicants um, coming through that process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's about, again, you know, we are, we're going to be supporting our children, young people, the most traumatised in, in the UK. We've got to ensure our foster carers have the skills, resilience um, to, to manage that, you know. And I make no bones about it, the process is long or it can be it is in depth um it does talk about people's lives their early childhood experience but we have to ensure that anybody coming through as a foster carer is going to be able to hold our children um and, and bring them through but also not impact on their own life you know there'd be nothing mm -hmm. worse for me as a race manager of this agency in 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 doing let's say a a, a fast assessment um of a foster carer and that assessment not being robust and we miss something. And for that carer with a child, something is triggered for that, that, that adult looking after that yeah. child that then may impact personally on their own life. You know, that'd be, you know, not, not a good thing to happen. So we've got to ensure the adults that are going to be supporting our children, even people, our foster carers, you know, that, that they are in the right place to do it. You know, that they've got a good support network, um, that we're not going to traumatize the adults maybe that have suffered early childhood trauma themselves. So mm -hmm. that's why that process is so important. The last thing we want is a, is a child having to leave a foster placement um, due to something that we might have missed. Um, yeah. We could have foreseen, I say. And that's it because a, a child having to leave is no good for the child. And it's no good for the foster carer. It impacts on the foster carer. Of course. I'd be really concerned if, if any of our foster carers uh, we wasn't impacted by a child having to leave. Um, yeah, to, to, to the reasons. It's, it's not what we want, is it? And and then just to speak a little bit more to that, you know, I mean, there's a degree of understanding I think that we have that that people might be frustrated at the process and maybe how long it might take or the different stages that you have to that you have to go through. I mean, we want people to come through as quick as possible. You know, it's it's in everybody's interests. We are here to help as many children as we can. And so we need as many carers as we can. And we do everything we can to make that process as streamlined and as quickly as, as possible, whilst making sure that it's thorough and the carers are properly prepared for that professional role. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think the word for me is safe. We've got to ensure it's a safe process and that's safe for everybody. 
that's safe for, like I say, the applicants, the foster carers, and the child and the young person. And that, for me, um, overrides everything, I guess. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it is. And it does seem, oh, doesn't it? Oh, we need foster carers. We need foster carers. Please come in, come in. Oh, hang on. Now we need to do this and we need to do that. <laughs> and I, so I can see that side of it. Yeah. But, again, it's about being safe and, and, and being and being ethical within that as well. Yeah. And so to, to people out there that are thinking about fostering either for the first time or something that they've been thinking about for a while, what is that process? What, what does that involve to apply to become a foster carer? Yeah, in a strange way, it's quite a fixed process, but it can also be quite loose. So, you know, the amount of foster carers that they've sort of taught to me over the, over the, the years, many years, uh, and thanks for that introduction, Mike, makes me feel very old as well, by the way. Um, but you know where they said, oh, you know, I've thought about this for years, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't, well, I didn't want to pick that phone up because of some of the things I've heard. You know, for us, our, our first process can be for anybody that's got questions, is a little bit unsure, just would like to find out more information. Give us a call. You know, um, you've got Caroline, who's our recruitment um, officer, who's there available to to just answer questions. Um, you know, our social workers are there available to answer questions. Uh, myself, I'm available if anybody wants to have a chat with me. So I guess the, what I would say for somebody that's thinking, this is something I've thought about, but I'm not sure it's right. Give us a call. Um, yeah. And that can either be by phone. You can drop us a message on Facebook. You can drop us a message on the website. If you're unsure, well, actually, I want more information, but I don't want to call yet. Get in touch via the web. We can send you an information pack out um, and let's take it from there. You know, it's very much going at the speed that, that somebody wants that information. Yeah. Yeah, and just a word on Caroline as well. She is a foster carer, so really she good is. person for people to speak to and try and get a better understanding of what that role involves. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so in terms of applying to foster, obviously we know that there's a lot of different agencies in the UK and there's local authorities as well. I think at last count, there's 300 independent agencies and obviously people yeah. can foster with their, with their council. So, you know, to people out there that are looking at this and, and maybe wondering what the best route is to take, what is it that you think makes family care different and sets us apart from some of the others? Yeah, I, th I think it's quite interesting, you know, and, and, I, and I'm very much aware and mindful of some of the publicity around independent foster agencies mm. um, that, that, that are operating. You know, for me, um, one of the greatest draws that allowed made me move to family care I believe is one of its greatest strengths that it's family owned you know th this organization is owned by the two sons of the original owner jed so for 35 years this organization is is within owned by a family um many of our carers know the owners mm -hmm. um which is highly unlikely if um, we had a carer who was with one of the larger organizations which, which can be quite faceless so i think for me it's it's important that carers are aware and have got the ability to know the staff structure. Who are these people, you know? Mm -hmm. um, many carers know me. They know Andrew O'Reilly, the group operations director, and I said before, you know, you know, the, you know the owners. So foster care is having direct access to the people running and managing that space is, is really important. Yeah. Our foster carers' involvement in the agency is, is really important to me. So we have a number of our foster care representatives in each location. They meet directly with myself on a quarterly basis. Um, and their role is to help and guide the agency from a foster carer's perspective. You know, it's very well. I've got experience with children's services, you know, looked after children, adoption. I've not been a foster carer, you know. So to get the perspective of foster carers in driving forward how we work i think is real real important so our foster care representatives they look at our policies before we roll out policies they look at changes they're there to bring questions to the senior management team where some of our foster carers may have questions about well, why we're doing this what's that service mm -hmm. about so it's real that real integrity you know that the, the, our foster care representatives are part of our our senior management team there's no yeah. doubt about that our therapeutic basis is key to me. Uh, many agencies say they are therapeutic. Many agencies say they work in a therapeutic model. I can't believe that any fostering agency can't work in a therapeutic model. Yeah. 
Um, so, but it's how that is then set up and run. And, and again, we know there are many different ways that that can be done for ourselves. What that means is invest in having therapeutic professionals within our fostering service. So our foster carers can access them therapies when needed to either look at managing, supporting our children, and young people, trying to understand behaviors, trying to understand what might be going on for this child and better responses to that young person. Um, or even for themselves. Mm -hmm. We know sometimes, you know, for our carers, frustrations, anxieties, um, trying to manage that young person's behavior on a 24 seven can really take its toll. So it's about having that support um, from a therapeutic level as well. Yeah. We have our own in-house support services. So again, these are based within our locality. So, you know, it's not one support worker that covers um, between, you know, Wolverhampton and, and Preston. We have support workers in the localities who do direct work with our children and young people. So again, where where we feel a, a young person just needs that extra support, that extra outlet um, or guidance, then our support workers can do some real specific targeted work um, to maintain that, that foster home and household. Um, so those are some of the, the, key, the, the key factors, I think, ourselves as a fostering organization um, are mm -hmm. able to support and deliver. And, and I think it's engagement with our children as well. You know, we do about 19 activities a year for our children and young people, including um, a, an outward bound residential that, that we do. And this is staffed by our internal staff. So this is staffed by our support workers, by our social workers, by our management team. You know, my, I myself go on these activities. And what it does is it allows our children, young people build relationships up with professionals um, that are meaningful, that, that they see a different side to us, you know. Uh, but also for us as professionals, we are able to look and see the children um, and how they are and how they manage. So rather than just a monthly one hour supervision visit to the foster carers where a young person might come in and out, actually spending three days with these children <laughs> in a residential in the middle of nowhere um you, you sort of gain and, and again can really aid in that and then that support to the carer because when the carer is saying look this is what this young person does this is how they struggle to manage yeah there's nothing like seeing it first hand yeah um, no i couldn't agree more and i think just to echo something you mentioned earlier you know that obviously there's lots of different things that people will be looking at and looking for from an agency but if you're not sure pick up the phone, give us a call, and yeah. you can ask the questions, get the answers that you need. There's no obligation for anything more than that. No. Um, and we really do take the view that if we can just help people to, to come into fostering, then um, that, that's really the ultimate, that's the ultimate goal for us. Um, just to, to give some contact information out there uh, on that point. So our, our phone number is 0800 677 -677. You can also contact us on our Facebook page. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn as well. Or you can go to our website, which is family-care.co.uk. And you can find a lot more information on the website about the different types of fostering, the application process, the training, fostering alliances, all important parts of understanding what fostering will entail and really setting the expectations for that fostering journey. Um, so I think that's probably a good point for us to, to leave it, Dave, just before we do. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I, I just think, you know, I, I always remember back, to, I always sort of reflect when I'm thinking back, thinking about the foster carers that I've, I've sort of come in, in touch with and been involved with and worked with. Um, and one springs to mind who, who Diana and Mario, and I think they're one of, one of our videos on our website, who thought about fostering for around three to four years, I think it was before they sort of got the courage to pick up the phone. Um, and they very quickly, when they started to be foster carers, realized this was the vocation and the profession, you know, let's not hide from that, that they wanted to be in. And so were kicking themselves that they didn't do it the three, four years earlier um, because they missed out on, on, on three, four years of, of what fostering brought to them. And children missed out on three, four years of what they could bring as foster carers. So again, I would just say, if, you know, if you're interested, if you just want to find out a little bit more, if you want to ask a question, 
pick up the phone, give, give somebody a call. There's always somebody available within the fostering service. Um, drop on the website or, or drop us a message through through Facebook and somebody will always give you a call back. Yeah, and thanks very much for that, Dave. We do have, as well, we do have a blog that looks at some of the differences between, say, fostering with the council versus private and also gives people examples of some questions to ask if they are making an inquiry. So once we upload this video, I will also drop a link for that blog into the comments section if people want to have a look at that. Um, but for now, thank you very much for joining us, Dave. I hope people have found that useful. If you have, give it a like, uh, drop us a comment, let us know what your thoughts are. If you've got any questions, let us know and we'll, we'll do our best to get them answered. Um, but for now, thank you very much, Dave. Well, thank you. Thanks for the time. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.